I'll tell you what, what got me, and I was, I was talking about my mom, how she convinced me to go ahead and go to the Coast Guard Academy. One thing she really instilled in me, and I tell it to the kids of today, and I tell it to my own kids, is if there's ever anything you think you might want to do, even if you don't think you'll ever be qualified, but if it's something you might want to do, and it doesn't cost you to apply, go ahead and apply for it and see if you get it. If you get it, then you can decide whether or not you really want to do it, but if you don't get it, then you know that, okay, someone made that decision and I can't do it. But don't ever be two days later in your life or 20 years later in your life saying, God, I wonder if I could have got that if I didn't apply for it or if I applied for it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've used that the whole way. When I was in the, uh, naval flight training, all Coast Guard pilots go through Pensacola and they had a program there where you could earn your master's degree in aeronautical systems while you were earning your wings. Well, most of us young pilots saying, I don't need a master's degree, I'm gonna be a pilot the rest of my life. But that little tweak, my mom saying, hey, if you have a chance to apply for it, you gotta apply for it. I didn't think I'd ever pass the GREs or get into graduate school. I applied, got accepted, got my master's degree in aeronautical systems. And if you look at the curricula in aeronautical systems, it's textbook made for a future astronaut. I mean, all the stuff we studied was a lot of the stuff that we had to learn or relearn as an astronaut. So it, it, that's what kept me going, It's just always applying for things. While you're on your ship, that's when you could apply for pilot training or apply for graduate school or whatever, but you had to spend that first year on a ship. Well, I was on a ship and things weren't lining up just right with people transferring in and transferring out. The CEO of my ship was actually a private pilot and he was having a hard time letting me go to flight training. But make a long story short, you know, I was one of the last guys in my class to go to flight training. I graduated in 72. In June of 72, most of the people that went to flight training went around June or July of 73. I didn't get to go till like November of 73. I didn't know that, yeah, I, I was afraid I wasn't gonna make it because it was filling up. So I got to go to flight training. My first tour of duty was up in Cape Cod. And when I was up there, it was really great. They had two types of helicopters and a fixed wing aircraft. And back in those days, they let you tr fly multiple aircraft. So I ended up flying two different helicopters while I was up there and became an instructor pilot. Did some pretty noteworthy rescues and after being there for four years got transferred to Alaska, Sitka, Alaska. And out there uh, I did some rescues that I ended up getting a couple of distinguished flying crosses for. We were probably, a, we were part of what's probably the largest maritime rescue ever. A cruise ship called the Prince and Dom was on a world around the world cruise and it burned up and sank in the Gulf of Alaska in a big gale and we went out and we rescued all 522 of them. I hoisted 115 of them in one day to safety. So that was kind of a, a, a neat rescue and I did a couple other rescues. After my tour of duty in Sitka, they needed an operational pilot to do the test flying of the Coast Guard's new helicopter. It's the H-65, which is this one right here in the front. It uh, was made in France, and because of my operational experience, they wanted a top operator to do a lot of the test flying. So I went down to Grand Prairie, Texas, did a lot of test flying on a helicopter, went over to Marignan, France, where they were being built, got my test pilot training while I was over there, did some really neat things with that, and oh, by the way, that master's degree in aeronautical systems that I got while I was in flight training really paid off in that. All the test pilot stuff and calculations and aerodynamics, I already had that background. So that just worked out perfect for that. Um, so go back to 1978, I'm up at Cape Cod. I've only been a pilot for a couple of years. I started applying to flight training. And then there was another class in 80 uh, I was in, still in Cape, or I was right at new in Alaska. I applied then. And then there was a class in 84, 85, 86. And in 86, there was actually people, I was stationed up in um, Traverse City, Michigan. Or I was on my way to Traverse City, Michigan. I wasn't there yet. I was still test flying in, in Grand Prairie, Texas. Guys were coming around in suits, you know, asking background investigations. And I said, wow, maybe I'm going to get selected for the astronaut program this year. Well, if you'll remember, in January of 86, that's when Challenger, or when Challenger blew up. 
and I was doing on my way to do some test flying up in uh, Canada with this helicopter. So my first thought was, oh man, there goes, you know, what a shame for those astronauts and their families. But my second thought was, God, that blows my chance for being an astronaut this year. Well, the very next year, in 87, I applied again and I got selected. Went down to Houston and became one of the group 12 astronauts. There was 4,600 plus or minus qualified applicants that year. Uh, they interviewed 120 of us and selected 15. So I really feel like I'm one of the luckiest people on the planet. I told you about, you know, knowing where I was when Alan Shepard flew. And, you know, that really impacted me. So even though we were in an academy, which is pretty confined system, and, you know, back in the days when I was in the academy, you couldn't have a TV until your first class, you had a TV room where all the first class, the seniors, you could watch TV certain hours, but we didn't have TVs in our room. We didn't have radios in our room. We could play a stereo. So we were pretty, you know, out of touch what was going on in the outside world. Plus, you know, the Vietnam War was still going on and, you know, we wore our uniforms. So, you know, we, we got to see people protesting outside our gates. But the little bit that I heard about, we actually landed on the moon. You know, I was out in the middle of the ocean when that happened. I was on my way over to uh, uh, Naples, Italy on a cadet cruise. And, you know, everybody celebrated, but we didn't get to actually see video of it until we came back to the United States. I guess video, was it video back then? I guess it was. But uh, every time we launched, it was, you know, I heard that we went to the moon. We, you know, walked on the moon, Apollo 13, you know, after Apollo 11. It just, you know, that was just amazing. And to see how those guys were able to think their way through it. So, you know, Apollo 11 really started it. And quite frankly, you know, I hadn't applied for the astronaut corps yet, but I assumed that whenever I got my chance, I was going to, and who knows, I'll be going to the moon. But, you know, we graduated in 72. Our last Apollo flight was in 72. And then again, you know, we had uh, Skylab and Apollo Soyuz, and, you know, we, the space shuttle program was being developed after we stopped those, and, you know, I was able to apply like I said, for the first time in 78, well, the first shuttle didn't fly till 81. You know, Columbia flew in 81. So really, I assumed that I was applying for the shuttle program back in 78, but it wasn't built yet. It wasn't flying yet. I just wanted to be an astronaut. So that inspiration of the guys on Apollo 11 and, you know, what they did and how they were able to do it, quite frankly, I assumed that I'd be doing something, you know, even maybe going further than the moon but the program ended up being the shuttle program, and, and I'm really proud of that. I mean, it's a real spaceship. It's a spaceship that could fly up in space. You could take up payloads. You could bring back payloads. You can you know, build the space station with it. So we were in really the only flying machine in space that's ever been built that wasn't like a capsule. You know, if you, I'm not belittling anybody else. You know, the guys that landed on the moon, they, they, they flew more than a capsule. They flew the lunar excursion module. But I'm very proud of our shuttle background, for sure. I flew on the 11th flight of Discovery, STS-41, back in 1990. And our primary mission was to deploy a satellite called Ulysses into a polar orbit around the sun. Uh, it was a very short flight. And, and what was interesting about Ulysses is that it was going to go around the poles of the sun instead of around the plane of the ecliptic, which is the plane that all the planets are in. And that takes a lot more energy. So Ulysses had to go all the way to Jupiter first to get a gravitational assist to slingshot back around and go around the poles of the sun. And, you know, that's when you say, boy, there's some really smart people out there. All we did was push the buttons, but these guys that figure that stuff out is amazing. But we had a very critical window. You know, we're up there in space. We're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. So we had a window, I think it was like three seconds long to be able to kick that thing out of the payload bay. And now it's traveling at 17,500 with us. And then in order to launch it at the right time towards Jupiter, we had to have it oriented in the right direction in a very short window to push the button and send it on its way to Jupiter. But that was a very short mission. That was back when you know, the shuttle was originally built to only fly short missions, to go up, deploy a satellite, do something, come back, and then fly again. But after the Challenger accident, which was back in 86, I was in the class of 87, I was in the first group selected after Challenger, you know, NASA, when they went back and did all of the, the studies, they said, you know, 
the, the most dangerous part and the most expensive part of getting into space is getting up there and coming back. So why don't we try to make these shuttles stay up there longer? So back when I was flying, we did a four-day mission. My first flight was just four days. We kicked Ulysses out of the payload bay. We did some experiments on the mid-deck. We had some white rats and we did some fires and then landed just four days later. The second flight, now NASA is trying to extend the duration of these shuttle missions by making bigger oxygen tanks, bigger nitrogen tanks. You know, we make our own air up there. We make our own electricity, our own water. So you had to make the bigger tanks to make these what we called extended duration orbiters. So my second flight was scheduled for seven days and our primary mission was to take a rocket motor up in our payload bay, catch up to another satellite that was called uh, Intelsat 6 that had been launched on an unmanned rocket, second stage failed, and it was stuck in a useless 800 mile high orbit where it was supposed to be way up in geosynchronous orbit, 22,300 miles up. So our mission on the very first flight of Endeavour, plus being our test flight, was to fly up there with a rocket motor, catch up to this satellite, grab it, put it on top of a rocket motor, do an engine change, and then kick it back out and send it on up to geosynchronous orbit. But it, I mean, it was an awesome mission, scheduled for seven days, but we failed, struggled for a couple days trying to grab it. The capture device that we tried to use had the satellite keep bouncing off. Um, but after trying for three days, we finally decided to put three astronauts out on a spacewalk and just grab it with their gloved hands and stop the rotation of it, and then finally take it in and strap it to the rocket motor. Only time ever in the history of human, human spaceflight that there's been three human beings outside the spaceship, three people on a spacewalk. So we sent it up to the right orbit and came home, you know, ended up extending the uh, flight two days, so it was a nine-day mission instead of seven, and came back home, it was a great mission.